All right, so I think we're back. Okay, so there's um, three main types of microscopes that we're going to be talking about. And um, you see we have two of them here in class. I have them at the front of the room. And then the third we don't actually have here in school. So this first type of microscope, the one we're going to use most frequently, okay, this microscope here, it's called a compound light microscope. And compound, what is a compound word? Two, uh, two, words. two words combined. Compound sort of means multiple parts. This is called a compound microscope because there's actually two different lenses that are magnifying the image as you're looking through this microscope. Okay? There's a lens here that magnifies the image. The light travels up through here, and then it's magnified again in the eyepiece. So these microscopes that we use give a magnification of from 40 to 400 times. So if you're looking at this under low power, what you're seeing through the eyepiece is 40 times larger than it's the actual size of the object. If you switch to the highest power objective, the image you're seeing is 400 times larger than the actual object. So that's the kind of magnification this compound microscope gets. This type of microscope here is called a, we call it a dissecting microscope, although it can be used in dissecting, but it can be used in lots of different ways. But that's what we call it. And the dissecting microscope is a little bit different. What's the main thing you notice about it? Very big. What? It's like two, two, two eyepieces is probably one of the biggest differences. Um, yeah, these are, not, these are cordless. They have a battery power. The, our dissecting microscopes have to be plugged in. Um, and it gives a lower degree of magnification. Ours in class go from 10x to 30x at most. So others might go higher to 40x or more, but generally they give a lower level of magnification. The third type of microscope is this microscope. This whole thing is the microscope, like would fit on a desk, has a computer monitor and these large tubes and. Um, pretty complex and very expensive, and it actually doesn't use light to make an image. It uses electrons. What do we call this microscope? You probably have heard of it. Oh. Close. Just called an electron microscope because it uses a beam of electrons rather than a beam of light to form an image. And an electron microscope can give magnifications up to or beyond a million times. Do we have one? No. no. We don't have one here at school. You might find them at, you find them at a university. I need that. Wait, yeah. how much are they dollars? Uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Oh, wow. I would guess. I mean, I don't exactly know. How big are they? Like I said, they would take up, you know, a section of this desk like this. Dollar? All right, so we're going to look at some images, some photographs taken through the eyepiece of a few types of microscopes, just to give us a sense of how things look through them. All right, so through the compound microscope, we can see single-celled living organisms. This is an amoeba. We will be looking at amoeba in a few weeks under the microscope. They're a living creature, but they're just one single cell. We will also look at paramecium and euglena, two other single-celled organisms that you might find in pond water. These are some others. We won't look at these, but these are also single-celled organisms, Vorticella, radiolarins, foraminiferans. These are all things seen under the compound microscope. But if you notice, everything looks pretty flat when you see it in a compound microscope. When we look at things through this dissecting microscope, it has a couple advantages. So first of all, like we said, it doesn't magnify an image as much, but it does have some other advantages. So on this microscope, the compound microscope, would I be able to look at my hand through this microscope? No. Why not? It's too big. It's too, big. It's too thick. In order to see anything under the compound microscope, it has to be thin enough that light from beneath passes through the object 
through the objective lens up through the eyepiece. So no, I couldn't look at my hand under this microscope. You might see it. You can only look at very, very thin slices of objects. However, with this dissecting microscope that I have, okay, would I be able to see my hand? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah, so this has, a, it's illuminated from this light at the top, so the light bounces off the object and then travels through the eyepiece. This allows you to see thicker objects that do not need to be so thin that light passes through. Also, the fact that it has two eyepieces allows it to create a three-dimensional looking image. So this is taken through the dissecting microscope. We can see the shadows. We can see the depth there of that um, aphid, an insect. Or if we look at a penny, it gives you a much more three-dimensional view of the object. Now, just to take a little side trip here, why does this microscope give you a good 3D view, but this microscope does not, gives you a two-dimensional view? Well? Because there's uh, two eyepieces and one Right. What gives us good, so humans have good depth perception. We can sense very well if an object's near to us or far from us. And it has to do with what we'll just said. Katie? Yeah, well, it's about our eyes and the position of our eyes. If you compare the eyes of a human to the eyes of, say, a fish, how are they different in terms of where they're located? Jackson? The eyes of a fish are like on the sides of the and the eyes are the Yes. So fish have good, what kind of vision do fish have? Peripheral. Good peripheral vision. They see a very, very wide area. Okay? Humans, however, with two forward-facing eyes do not have great peripheral vision. You know, it's about 180, a little more degrees or so. But two forward-facing eyes give us good depth perception. Do you know how our brain tells our, us that an object is near to us or far? Not quite. Is it good? Not quite. Have you ever put your finger in front of your face and like open and close one eye? Yeah. What does it do? Focus it. Is your finger actually moving? No, it's because. No, it's because when I put my finger in front of my right eye, if I'm looking only with my left eye, I'm seeing it at this angle. And I'm seeing it straight on with my right eye. So when I open and close eyes, it seems to appear in a different position. Now, what if you look at it, if you hold it way out, how much is the difference? Very right? yeah. Less. And if you look across the courtyard at something and do the same thing, objects that are far away, it hardly changes at all. So our brain picks up on this information. If our brain says, okay, I'm seeing this object and the right eye sees it here, the left eye sees it at quite a different spot, well, that object must be very close to me. And our brain says, if I look far out and I see an object and basically both of my eyes are seeing in the same position, our brain interprets that and tells us that object is far away. Has I ever used, tried like those virtual reality goggles or like Google Cardboard? So all of those technologies work in the same basic way. They all show both of your eyes a different image. Okay? They show your right eye one image. They show your left eye almost the same image. But objects that they want appear to appear close to you, they make them offset in the image going to each eye. Objects that they want to appear far away, they show basically the same image. Have you ever worn those like red and blue 3D glasses and you look at a picture? Same thing. The filters allow one eye to see one set of lines, the other eye to see another, and anything on the picture that they want to look like it's close to you, the red and the blue lines are far apart from each other. And uh, when they want it to appear far away, they put the lines right next to each other. So all of these things work because that's how our 3D vision works. Both of our eyes get a different angle at an object, and that's how we tell them if it's near or far. Because 
the dissecting microscope has two eyepieces, okay? It allows us to get a good sense of depth. Also, you know, if you've ever, like, you wear contacts and um, one, one fell out, or if you had to wear an eye patch because you injured your eye, or something like that. Um, if you only have one eye open, it's much harder to have a good depth perception. Like if you try and play a sport or something or play catch with just one eye open, it's much, much harder to judge the distance something is when you only have one eye. Um, does this have anything to do with the left brain right brain? Not really, separate. And when you wear the eye patch, is that why people with lazy eyes do that? Sometimes to strengthen to change how the muscles work in those eyes. Yeah, like your brain sort of blocks out because you, you're, you're seeing, because one eye is missing your finger, one eye is seeing it, and so your brain kind of puts that so together and fills you in that space. Yeah. All right. The electron microscope, Jackson? Uh, Dad, I just had a question about like, the 3D thing. How come um, it's like red and blue and stuff? It could be any colors, but. Like, if you, wear, if you have any of those pictures, you have to put the red and blue glasses on. If you take them off, what is the picture drawn in? Red and blue. So what happens is the red filter means when you have, if you have the red filter on your right eye, it means the right eye is only going to see the blue right and opposite for the left. And so it's just a way of them to trick you into seeing two different things in each eye. And if you ever have, went to, like, a new 3D movie, um, where they have those weird glasses you have to wear. They're polarized in different ways, and it does the same thing. It allows your right eye to see one image and your left eye to see another image. All right, electron microscopes give great magnification. However, the objects that you're looking at generally have to be like coated in a thin layer of metal to see them. So generally you can't see living things, like the spider is dead when this electron microscope image was made. But they're usually grayscale images. Sometimes they're artificially colored. But they're really cool. You can see this is pollen grains. Human hair. Again, this is artificially colored, but that's a fly. The foot of a fly are these tiny little hairs, which allows it to cling to surfaces. This is fur from a cat, and this is a flea in the fur. That's a needle and thread. Wow. <laughs> Some more cool images from the electron microscope. She shows a bee and praying mantis. It's a mantis. Fly. Bee. you guys are going to have to know um, is the parts of a microscope. And so we'll name them and tell a little bit about what they do. They're all listed here for you. Now this microscope is like the kind we used to use. It had to be plugged in. Um, we have these newer ones, which actually are not quite as good as these. They have a few new features, these new ones, but they're, um, they break pretty easily. They're not very durable. But anyway, when we're using a compound microscope, the image we're seeing gets magnified by two lenses, two different lenses. One of those lenses is this. It's called the eyepiece. It has a certain level of magnification. Our eyepieces always have 10x magnification. It says right on the, the rim of this, 10x. You could buy other microscopes that have a different level of magnification. The other lens that magnifies the image is down here. Our microscopes have three different objective lenses of different powers. Okay, but they're called the objective lens. We have a low, medium, and high power lens. Our microscope's low power is 4x, medium power is 10x, high power is 40x. 400? 40. 
So I'm guessing you have to like rotate to get like the Yeah, you kind of so the to select different lenses you rotate this round part. That's called the nose piece. Okay. The nose piece you rotate to select one of the objectives. The objectives click into place. You know, you have to be clipped into place in order for this to work properly. The space between the objective lens and the eyepiece lens, this, this tube here, on these microscopes it's straight up and down. It's called the body tube because these lenses need to be a specific distance apart. Okay, so that's the um, body tube. Now, on our microscopes, we have a built-in battery-powered LED light. Some types of microscopes, like these dissecting microscopes, you have to plug in and it has a light. Other types of microscopes, we don't have any of these. Our older style microscopes. What is this? That's a mirror. Yeah, that's a mirror. We don't have any microscopes with a mirror. We're going to call this the light source. Older microscopes had a mirror and you had a separate light source. You would shine a little lamp at the mirror and it would reflect the light up through the microscope. On the old microscopes? No, I'm guessing. On new microscopes, it's built into the base. The old ones had two separate pieces. You had your microscope, and then you had a lamp that you would shine the light at the mirror. This part where you put objects to view, we put slides on a compound microscope, is called the stage. Is there a crowd? Just you, crowd of one. Now this microscope has clips. This microscope has clips. You call them stage clips. They hold the slide down. These microscopes have some, something different. These have like a clamp here, and we call this the mechanical stage because you can move the slide around using these dials. It's a nice feature to have, although it breaks a lot. But So this microscope's a little different than this one in the diagram. The, on your quiz, it'll be a microscope like this. So this one has these stage clips that hold the slide in place. On the bottom of the stage is a dial. You can see it here. You can rotate it. And what's on the bottom of the oven? Can you see what that dial has in it? It's a disc. It's a disc. And Looks like the thing on a pencil trip. Yeah. There's different size openings. Yeah. So what do you think this controls? The monoblating yeah, how much light's going through. If I have a small hole selected, it lets just a little bit of light through. And it changes the brightness, because sometimes you look through these microscopes, it's too bright, and you want it a little bit dimmer. So that part that regulates the um, amount of light is called the diaphragm. Then you have sort of the bulk of the microscope is the bottom, the base, and the, the part that holds the rest of the microscope is the arm. You said like it would be too bright. If you're looking at the microscope, for, like if you're looking in that for like a long time, if you like stop looking at it, would it like... like yeah, if you had really bright and the diaphragm all the way open, it would be like, you know, just like being in bright light, it would it might bother your eyes after a while. Yeah, you might see spots after you use that. Um, now, this microscope, so this microscope has two knobs on it. Okay. Now, these and this microscope, they're built in together. Well, you could see it raises and lowers the stage. What do you think that does? People always think it does the wrong thing. Julia? Uh, just uh, Yeah, just the image in what way? Zoom. No, that's what people always think. I was hoping somebody would say that. It doesn't actually zoom in on your object. All it does, Bella? Maybe make it a little bit more clear. It makes it clearer. It makes it in focus. So it makes your image in focus. So you have two knobs. This bigger knob, and on here it's like this outer part, moves the stage a lot. You could see it moving a lot. That's called the rough or coarse adjustment. It quickly adjusts your image so you can focus it. But the smaller knob makes much smaller adjustments. Like when I turn the smaller knob, it does move, but not nearly as much. This is for sort of fine-tuning your image to being sure it's in focus. It's called the fine adjustment.
All right, we just did this. I don't think we need to do it right now. Let's look at some other cool pictures. Tell me. Oh, no. If you have a guess of what this is. You're never going to get it. These are taken in uh, microscope images. Ribs. This is like a DVD or a CD. What? That's where like the information is stored. Oh, and it's I see. Because like the rainbow. Stairs. Those are stairs. What? It looks, it looks like, like it's, not, it's not stairs. It's through a microscope, like so it's something like magnified. Like an airbed? It looks like there's like yeah. wood. It's coming something out. very small that appears to be magnified like this. Uh, oh. It's a razor. Oh. 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 What's that like what black smudge? What, that? Yeah. yeah. That's like the hole, that's where like a screw would hold the razor onto oh. the handle. Oh, oh. wow. Marshmallow. No, it's something small. Sugar. Salt. Well, so you're close. Though, Marshmallow. Salt. And pepper. Salt. 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 Kleenex. It's a type of tissue, but people might just call it. Velcro is actually a brand name for what is the generic name for Velcro? Is it, is it elastic? Nope. No. Hook and loop fastener. What? How does Velcro work? The scratchy side of the Velcro is this. It's made of these fairly stiff plastic hooks. Oh, so it's like that. And the soft side of Velcro is are these sort of loops of thread. And when you press them together, the loops, the hooks sort of loop um, latch on to the little loops of thread. And when you pull it off, these hooks flex and then you could separate it. And that's how Velcro works. Yeah, we talked about that in the coconut. Oh, uh, oh, that's a shirt. Is that Look at all the fibers that make it. Is that brown? It's poop toilet. I mean, I don't know. Muscle. Tangled wires. No. Rubber band. Looks like a rubber band. It's related. These are, this is what a nylon stocking, you know, that you might wear with like a skirt, like stockings. They're actually made of these fibers of nylon material all woven together. It looks like the earbuds when you put them on your pocket. Oh, a Oh, a banana. Oh, banana. That's a banana. Oh, banana looks like a luxury fountain. A banana. A crater. A tunnel. No, it's an apple. It's through a microscope. It's a metal. It's like a hard metal. Apple. It plays music. CD. A record player. Oh, a record. That's the groove of a record, and the bumps in that groove of a record vibrate a needle, which makes a sound. No, that's too deep. We got it. It's under a microscope. Red sticks. <laughs> the longer versions of the Nutella sticks. Toothbrush. What? Oh, the bristles of a toothbrush. Grass. It's under a microscope. Hair. No. Cat move. Carrot. Actually. Eyelash. Wow. Oh, ew. My eyes are where are their eyes? How is that gray stuff? That's green. Eyelash. That's human hair. Well, chopsticks. Well, it is the gray stuff. It's under a microscope. It's under a microscope. Whatever it is. And toothbrush. Finish up on Monday with us. It's under a microscope. I know.